Well, I'm going to start with the story. Once upon a time, there was a forecaster from Goodland who wanted to improve his mesoscale analysis to better serve their partners in the area. So he applied to and was skeptic to go to the mesoanalysis boot camp. So I'll be sharing some of the things I learned. Uh, but first off, I'm going to give you just a basic overview of the structure. Then we're going to touch on some key takeaways that I, I got from the week there at Kansas City. Also mentioned a few helpful displays they encourage us to use when we come back to our offices. And then for those of you who may not be quite familiar with what exactly Muslim Analyst does on the typical forecast, we'll kind of gloss over the general duties there, and then we'll tie it up in a nice bow with some high points for the conclusion. So to start off with the structure, well here's a picture of what it looked like at the Operational Proving Ground Boot Camp. There was two, four, five different workstations there in the room, and we worked in pairs the entire week. The first two days were more instruction, just really reviewing our prerequisite materials and kind of just reviewing in general some of the things we knew but we hadn't quite really applied in an operational sense. The bulk of the week was these two days, the Wednesday and Thursday. We had a case in the morning and a case in the afternoon. And for each case, we had about two hours to do a mesoanalysis of different parts of the country wherever this event was going to take place. And then create a mesoscale AFD and also a graphic either for our partners or for the customers in general that will be affected. And they use the term repeatedly of tactical IDSS, basically very pointedly saying, here is the area we're concerned about, this is the what, the when, and the where, and give them specific information so they could act on that information. And the goal is right here was to accurately anticipate what in this case the radar would look like in one, two, maybe three hours, and then communicate specifically what, when, and where to the public. Make it so they can act on what we're suggesting is going to happen. So starting into the key takeaways, the first one is being a mesoanalysis, being that, having that task on shift, is having a different mindset. Uh, as it was brought up repeatedly during the week, you are acting as the weather safe net for that office. So in other words, you're taking a look at satellite data, service observations, a second eye on the radar, making sure nothing is, is lost in the, all the activity. Um, any, part, any data you could look at, basically taking that in, and then based on your experiences, what we know with meteorology, extrapolating that out into the future. Not very long, again, just one, two, maybe three hours, so you can have an idea of what we're gonna be seeing in the future and then as needed, create any graphics that hopefully set the groundwork for our watches or warnings that we may be needing to issue in the future. And also, this mindset is going to help the office remain weather ready, not weather reactive. We're not saying we're going to build a weather reactive nation, we're building a weather ready nation. And we do that with a different mindset of not reacting, but being proactive with our forecasts. Another takeaway, and this is something I struggle with personally, is not anticipating a linear extrapolation with the weather. So in other words, I come in on shift to do an excellent job of mesoanalysis, and I say, all right, this is what I expect to have happen, and then I don't do anything else. I get caught up in something else, or I think I have a good enough understanding that I don't look at any more data, and I'm expecting the weather to behave linearly. That is a very dangerous thing to do, because as we all know, and has been brought up already today, the weather can have a mind of its own. We can think it's going to do one thing, but if we're not staying in tune, staying situation aware with that, we can easily be taken off guard. So having a linear mindset or a linear expectation for the weather is a very bad idea. Now you might be thinking, environment matters, well duh, we all know that. Well let me ask you this. Say in, you're the radar operator for your forecast area. SBC has issued a moderate risk for the day, and we have a hash jerry on top of that for two inch or greater hail potential. Your mesoanalyst has given you an update that any storms that form are going to build very quickly. They're not going to just pulse up, but once they get going, they would continue to maintain their intensity. So, as you would expect, you see storms form. They're not quite severe, and you have, as every day, your basic threshold. Okay, if storms get to here, let's say, um, Let's just say reflectivity-wise, if I see cores up to this height or if I see mesh at this big, I'm going to issue. Well, on a day like today, when you know it's going to happen, do you wait for the hail to get that big? Or do you go ahead and issue the warning before the storm, well before the storm shows signs of being severe because you're in tune with your mesoanalysis? 
I know in the past, I would have been hesitant to because my confidence may not have been there that I knew the environment. But through this boot camp and through just experiences here in Goodland, I've been able to assess when I need to let the storms prove themselves and when I can know this is a strongly forced day. I have high confidence that these storms, once they get going, they're going to be severe. So I'm going to issue the warning really early. So early that people might be wondering, is this guy out to lunch or something? Um, in fact, we had, I think it was May 17th, we, we had the tornadoes in Nebraska. The storm actually started just south of Goodland, dropped two inch or greater hail over my house. We have to have a roof replaced, unfortunately. Uh, but on that day, I knew it was a sure bet, sure bet. We're going to have severe hail, so I issued the warning right away and got that lead time out a lot sooner than we would have otherwise waiting for that storm to reach a certain criteria. And this is something Rich Thompson said that kind of caught my attention, just looking at the environment. He said, if we were to warn tornado warnings only just on what S the STP values are, we'd have a better verification than our national average. So again, kind of have that mindset of looking at the environment. Along with that, subtle boundaries can have a drastic influence on what the weather is going to be doing, such as different so mixing boundaries like hot versus warm or moist versus dry. We had at least two scenarios where if you didn't pick up on this little aspect here, you would miss the big picture of, wow, we have, you know, it might be just a minor wind shift or a slight gradient dew points, but some days that's all you need to have very explosive severe weather. Pattern recognition. Now this is not speaking in the sense of synoptic scale, but more of you know the soundings or the photographs. You know, I'm sure you guys have experiences in the past where you remember what a sounding looked like on a very noteworthy day or leading up to a noteworthy day. You know, have those in mind when you're looking at the data and realizing, wow, this sounding looks like this day, or I recognize a pattern this photograph was something we had a year or two ago, and then communicate that to your partners so they can kind of keep the event, the upcoming event in perspective, kind of give them some historical context, so to speak. Excuse me. Um, a side note on photographs, and again, I'm kind of pointing the fingers back at myself here. If you're not using photographs in your forecasting process, you're really doing a disservice to yourself. And Rich Thompson, he didn't really harp on this, but he mentioned it at least a couple times during the week that photographs can, can kind of be the forgotten stepchild. You know, when it comes to environmental analysis, there's just so much great information you can get from that one piece of data. So and I encourage you, and I'm doing this myself, is you know, put more weight toward those photographs and incorporate those more into your forecast process if you're not already. All right, another key takeaway. Which do you have more displays of when you're on the forecast test? And this is saying you're not the radar operator. You know, you're a, a, like the forecaster for the evening shift or you're maybe, the, in this case, the mesoanalyst. Do you have more radar displays or satellite displays on your AWIPS? If you have more radar displays, that means you're more focused on the present and you may not even be aware of it. Whereas if you're looking at satellite in conjunction with the radar, then you're able to better anticipate what the storms are going to be doing, what the environment's slowly changing and morphing into. Because, you know, look here. Now, these two images were taken at almost the exact same time. You know, here uh, we have visible satellite. We can see, you know, it looks like there's maybe a scattered line of thunderstorms that might be forming there. Uh, these clouds here, I don't know if you quite see them, indicate maybe the environment's a little more stable over there. But you go north to the, here's our Kansas-Nebraska border. Those clouds look a little bit more agitated. Whereas you look at the radar at the same time, yeah, there could be some scatter storms developing. We don't quite know what the extent of that future line will be, like we will be able to kind of get a, an idea of here. And then there, there is nothing on radar indicate to us that that's becoming more unstable with time. So just, just some you know, things like that to kind of incorporate more into your forecast uh, duties that will keep you more in tune with what could be happening instead of what's happening right now and how to deal with it immediately. Now this might have a few of you squirming in your seats, and I'm, I'm not trying to throw cams under the bus here. They're very, very uh, useful tools. Uh, this was a, a graph that was shown by Rich Thompson. I, I apologize, I don't have the paper up, so if any of you would like to get this, uh, come see me afterwards and I can find that information for you. But he used this to kind of give us an idea of just keeping them in perspective. So this graph here is the stats at, based at a grid point, the verification at a single point for that date range. And here is the models at the NSSL, the NAM4, 
uh, NAM 4P, NMM, uh, ARW, and I think NMM model. On the Y axis, we have probability of detection, and on the X axis, we have the success ratio. And at a specific point, looking at what's going on versus the radar, not too good for just point based. And when you look at the grid spacing here, you kind of see why. Even when you get down to four kilometer spacing, that's really good resolution, but on the storm scale, there's still quite a bit of data and features that we could be missing there. So what do you say we improve this over and go to a 40 kilometer neighborhood approach? So same data, same date range, we're just now using a neighborhood approach instead of a, a single point. And we did see, as we would expect, an improvement. So I guess the point here is the cams, they're very useful, but we try to avoid taking them as a deterministic model. The best way to view this data that was communicated to us is use it like the HREF, where it's an ensemble of those short-term high-resolution models, because it's, it's very easy to get sucked into, wow, these two, ver these two runs, the HRRR, they're showing this, so I better get the forecast to match it. Well, wait a minute, what about all those other models that are ingesting the same data? You know, we don't want to just throw them out with the bathwater, so to speak. So, you know, and if all we're going to be doing is just making sure our forecast matches the latest version of the HRRR, we're not really adding value to the forecast. You know, if that's all we want to do, then, you know, why do we need to be here? We're not really serving our customers then. So moving on to some helpful displays. Uh, this one I've just started using since I got back, and this is actually, if you were to go into the satellite menu in AWIPS, this is the name you would find, Day Cloud Phase. And right here we have yellow for the colors of the clouds, and, then we have, and that is the liquid content of the, of the clouds, so that's liquid water. So you see yellow here in the clouds, that means they're liquid water, and this bluish purple, I would call it, is, that means more ice. So this helps us distinguish ice from liquid water, which in the wintertime would be extremely useful. Uh, but more this time of year might help us know, okay, these clouds might be a little bit more susceptible to producing lightning than, than we might expect or at least less expect. Uh, another, this is probably my favorite one, and, and this again is called Daytime Cloud Phase Distinction. That's the actual name in AWIPS. And there's just a lot of information you can get from this one display. And it's looking again at, at the cloud tops and the, the phase of the liquid in it. So the lime green, I don't know if you can quite see that, but the lime green areas, that indicates glaciation. The liquid clouds are going to be this lighter blue here. And then the high clouds are going to have ice or more of your oranges. Now the bolder, the greens, and the yellows, that indicates a stronger updraft. Now, one way I used this recently when we had fairs, especially it was the Rollins County Fair, I believe. I had this display up, and I noticed, wow, I'm seeing a lot of glaciation in this cloud, and it's approaching the Rollins County Fair. So I actually called up the EM and said, hey, I'm seeing a potential for lightning to increase in your area within the next 20 minutes. And they appreciated it, and this was even before anything showed up on radar. So I was able to use satellite data to give them a heads up about lightning before a, th a thunderstorm even showed up on our radar. Now, the last helpful display I'll touch on, this really isn't a display, it's just a subset, is our meso mesoscale sectors we have with the GOES uh, satellites. And if, if you're really not utilizing these, I, again, it's really a disservice to the forecast because there is such great detail you can get out of these one-minute sectors. And we have four. We have two for the east and two for the west. So at usually this time of year, they're pretty close to our neck of the woods. Uh, if they're not, you know, I, I think it's, um, is it the Detroit office? I couldn't remember that we still call. We can actually have them shift that, you know, if need be. You know, the worst they can tell us is no. Um, another kind of sneaky way, I'll say, to move the mesosectors is to call SPC and say, hey, you know, I see we're not quite in the slight or the moderate risk. Would you mind just nudging that our way a little bit so we can maybe have that mesosector over us? And, you know, SPC says, hey, you know, we'll look at it, and if it's reasonable, we'll do that. You know, kind of help, help each other out. So, again, with the one-minute data, it's, it, there's just so much detail you can see that the five-minute data is great. It's a vast improvement of what we had with the previous satellite generation, but we can still miss those subtle details that the one-minute data would have. So, kind of bringing this together, what does the mesoanalyst do? Well, they monitor the present through service observations, satellite data, also satellite 
lightning data. That's another key importance for determining storm trends and evolution. Radar data and SPC mesoanalysis. And again, based on the data, like I have here, you're going to anticipate, or your goal is to anticipate within the next one to three hours what we're going to be dealing with. You know, that way you can adjust staffing, messaging, you know, if needed, so you're not reacting when the storms do something you're not expecting. You're kind of playing offense, as John Gordon likes to say when he's in our office. We want to be offense, not defense. And then, of course, as we've been touching on repeatedly today, you want to communicate what you're seeing of, with your forecasters and radar operators and you know, using 800 megahertz, graphics, phone calls, whatever means are necessary to get what you're seeing out to our partners who really need that information. So conclusions, weather forecasting is not dead. Contrary to what, too bad Mark left. Contrary to what the old timers like Mark Buller will say, it is not dead. We can still add that value that's needed in the first, at least the first few hours of the forecast, if not the first six. Also, the goal of the mesoanalysis, I've kind of repeatedly said here, is to be able to anticipate what the radar is going to be showing us in one, two, or three hours so we can be ready for it and not be reacting to what the weather is going to be doing. Also, the mesoanalysis is the weather safety net for the office. They're going to kind of have all the reasonable worst case scenarios in mind so we don't have something come out of left field and surprise us. We have the staffing, we have the messaging adequate the way we need it to be. And also leverage satellite data. I know it's still kind of new to some of us as far as the capabilities, but don't be afraid to use some different satellite procedures you may not have been accustomed to, especially the ones that I showed. There's just a lot of great data there that are at our fingertips, especially when you have mesosectors over you. And you know, I, I'm not trying to date myself here, but hand analysis, that wouldn't hurt to bring that back to some extent. Uh, at the boot camp, I actually did that with all four cases. I would do you know, a few minutes and do just a basic service analysis of where are the fronts, the highs and the lows. And that helped actually very quickly get into my head what the, the trends are with the weather. So I had an idea very quickly what was going on. Now, if you didn't want to break out the color pencils and be seen printing off surface maps, you know, be mocked by the rest of your coworkers. There is a program under the tools menu in AWIPS called PGEN. And you can actually do hand analysis on the screen using your mouse. You can draw, it's almost to the point you could draw smiley faces. At, they have so many different um, icons you could put on there, you know, fronts, highs, lows, uh, storm icons, all sorts of things. So again, it's under the tools menu and it's called PGEN. And then that's really a great tool. I haven't quite used it yet, but if, again, if you don't want to print off the hand analysis and do that by hand, you, you do have the capability to do it through AWIPS. So that's all I have. Uh, looks like I beat the clock, so I'll have time for any questions. Yes? Just a comment, I'll second the use of the day cloud phase satellite product. If you remember two years ago, Zach did a, uh, a talk on that and getting the jump on for DSS purposes, lightning, which is a big deal for yes. uh, all the outdoor events. Just be a little careful on time of day and season. But other than that, yeah. I'd yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Welcome. Yes? Uh, go ahead. Uh, just to uh, echo your comments about being uh, proactive instead of reactive. We've got a culture, I think, too much with warning level decision that we just react to what's ongoing. So um, I really champion that. And that part of the, the goal of the mesoanalysis is to help facilitate that. Also with maybe an additional radar interpreter. Yes. Not, not decision maker, but interpreter. Mm -hmm. um, and the final comment I have is, with all due respect to Rich Thompson, uh, we do not want to warn off of SDP because it'll make our current false alarm right. look like a dream. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with all due respect to Rich, I know him well. And we don't want to go there. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, is there any use of the GLM data? I, I actually have been using that more. And so, what was it? A week ago, I was on the radar shift and I was monitoring the, the GLM lightning data in conjunction with one of my satellite displays I showed. And I was mentioning on Indevis chat, hey, I just saw this drop over the last 15 minutes in lightning activity, and we're starting to see this notch, and, and like indicating a rear infrared jet with the storms coming in. Looks like they're just going to miss Red Willow County, so we should be okay. And not 10 minutes later, we get a report of downed power lines on the eastern edge of Red Willow County. So, yeah, I've, I guess this, at least for me personally, 
I'm still getting getting the courage up and the confidence up to, I guess, use what I've learned. You know, it's still kind of new in my own head. Uh, but yeah, GLM data is, is very important, especially when you apply it to satellite. Okay. Do, do I have time for one more? One more. Okay, well being a classmate of Jesse's and Brian's, um, if you all, if the announcement comes out again, I think it should be a required course for everybody. It's very intimate. There's only spots for 10 people. Each, they did three, so 30 people went through this course. But um, by all means, apply and and it, it's amazing. Ariel, if you know Ariel, he has a big passion for teaching uh, what he knows and uh, is very worthwhile. Yeah, it, may, it lets you practice what you kind of learn in the <clears throat> common modules in real time. So, yeah. well, thank you.